Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking for the final part of our conference today, and it's, it makes a special honor, pleasure, I was even joy to introduce to you Professor Andrea Graziosi. Professor Andrea Graziosi is a man of very many talents, known in very different fields and different countries. He has been born in Italy, he graduated from the Napoli University, but he also is a fellow of the United States, Davis Russian Center, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, and uh, he has a, how should I say, has a very impressive uh, numbers of teachers and professors, the famous ones, the one who refers to the classics in the Soviet and Russian studies. This is for first, first place Moshe Levin, and especially Michael Confino, the ones who introduced the peasant aspect in the Russian, in the Soviet, Russian, Soviet, Soviet, Soviet studies. And uh, has been known for many publications. I will probably several of them, which I believe is of the, of the primary importance. Uh, the one is uh, War and Revolution in Europe, 1905, 1956. This is the most synthetic work that I know probably published in two languages only, in Italian and Ukrainian. I'm not yes. a, there is a Russian, but that's, that's it, so to say. So Ukraine was probably one, on the one, one of the first. Then he is also known for his uh, uh, another synthesis. This is Soviet history, of this history of Soviet, Soviet, Soviet Union. And uh, just we have kind of luck that at a certain moment of his career, Professor Andrei Graziosi moved to Ukrainian studies and particularly started to deal with the Holodomor. In my humble opinion, Professor Andreas Graziosi is the specialist in the Holodomor studies. Uh, and I would just turn your attention to the article, which I believe defines in many ways how we discuss nowadays about the Holodomor. This is an article which is called that uh, uh, famine in, in USSR, 31, 33, and Ukrainian Holodomor. Uh, is, is there a possible, possibility of new interpretations? This has been published in English, Ukrainian, and uh, uh, Italian, although it's English and Russian. And also I would like to uh, draw your attention to a very important book. And this is the Bolsheviki Ukrainsky Christiani, which is published in Russian, then be translated shorter version in English. In short, we are extremely lucky to have Professor Andrea Graziosi here because I would hardly imagine somebody better who would fit the idea of our conference. The whole the more as a genocide. So, Andrea, the floor is yours. Of course, I will now disappoint everybody because after this presentation, it's difficult to keep up, as they say. And of course, it's a very somber topic but I think it's a topic of extreme interest. The title I gave uh, is Famines and Genocides, a Global Perspective, but of course I will also talk and speak about the Ukrainian Holodomor, which will have a place of honor, actually, in my speech. And of course I will not say anything that's new, but at the end, when I put together all the pieces of 36 years of studying this, I think what I offer is, it's, it's a good synthesis. I was, at the end, I think it came out well. I, I have to say, maybe you will not agree, but I was surprised. I, I, to tell the, I started to, 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 to study this in 1985, when I discovered this document on the Italian diplomatic document, by chance, on the uh, Ukrainian famine in the archives of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Archives, which is 35 years ago. I then moved into the peasantry and the Soviet regime, not only because of those teachers, but also because in the Soviet archives, we had this project of publishing the GPU's Wodki on the peasants, and also I found all the material on the failed Bolshevik government in 1919 that he referred to in his uh, intervention, because that failure was the formative uh, moment also for Stalin, because the whole government collapsed, and Stalin was there, and Trotsky too was there. And then, of course, 
came the result of all this, what has been called the archival revolution with the partial opening but substantial of the Soviet archives in the 90s. And the article he mentioned came out of the reflection based upon the new discoveries in the archives. We had the Kaganovich Stalin correspondence, we had the Balitsky papers, we had this vodka, the Gepi was vodka I told you about. And, and, and then, of course, slowly the, the, the pieces went together. And, and what I will try to do now is to uh, combine what I did recently. For example, we had a special issue of nationality papers on the Ukrainian famines that I think came out very well. Also, thanks, this too has been mentioned by co the contribution of demographers that now and they are very important. I think they are opening. They are in the, on the cutting edge, edge of research in this. And, and this long story, and also we had a, we had a, a big forum on European his, uh, Historic Quarterly, which is a good journal. So it's also what this long history of mine dealing with the peasants, the, the, the Ukrainian history, the, the, the Holodomor, Stalinist repression, it is also a positive story in the sense that when I started this in 85, actually the book by Conquest was not still out. And the debate was there was not a famine in the, United, in the Soviet Union, not even in Ukraine. There was pure denial. The, 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 the level of polemics even within, let's say, university circle was extremely primitive. So from this point of view, looking back uh, from now, you know, 35 years later, I think one can be optimistic in the sense the profession, in spite of all the, the things that Bogdan Kreed said, that the hypothesis that by now should be fully accepted, are not yet fully accepted, but the progress has been really considerable. And, you know, this you can say, but I remember after the article he mentioned that, that I published in 2005, I wrote a very famous friend, I will not mention, that was the editor of a very major American journal, and proposed, why don't we have a special issue on the famines in the Soviet Union? Because there are many. There is not just Ukrainian, there is the Kazakh. I had a graduate student who is now a professor, Nikolo Pianciola, that just published the first article, I think, on the Kazakh famine scholarly article, there is the Kazakh, there is the Volga Germans, we are in Germany, the Volga German, the, the family in the Volga German was a republic, in the Volga German Republic was terrible, there is the Northern Caucasus, there is the Soviet famine, why don't we publish an assessment of this? And she, she I will say that she's just she, she replied, wow, but this, we are not ripe, it's very interesting, we are not ripe for this. This was 15 years ago. That is, a major journal would tell that this was not a right topic. Nowadays, you have major journal like Nationality Papers that publish special issues on this. So this to give you know, a good uh, feeling. I have a good, uh, things have been done. And also you think of Applebaum's and Applebaum's book. You know, it's a new, uh, in, you know, it's a solid history. And I think, <laughs> Also, this is my latest development, by studying and discovering that there were so many political famines, this is how I call them, I'm not the only one, uh, in, the, in the Soviet Union in the 30s, but then you discover not only in the 30s, you start to ask yourself, uh, what about political famines in the 20th century? Because after all, this was mentioned today, the Herrero uh, in, in Namibia, Hunger was used, starvation was used as a means of extermination, targeting specific groups. And then you have, you know, the Armenian, you know, after the, 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 the Western allies threatened the young Turks that repression was going to come if they lost the war, they started to kill a mass Armenians and they resorted to other methods, starvation being a very prominent one. And the British strategy of war was to you know, use starvation and hunger to subdue the central empires. This was an official British strategy. And you can go on and on, you know, and this strategy was replied by the Nigerian government with British backing against the Biafra and the Igbo in 68. That is, you have an insurgent countries and you use starvation systematic 
to subdue it into submission. And then you started to continue to, to study and to discover because you, 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 by, by now you have understood that we had understood that there were many famines within the Soviet Union with different characteristics. And of course, there is the great famine from the, the great leap forward in Mao's China. There is the, the Ethiopian one. There is the, the Cambodian one. So this has been a century of political famines of huge importance in determining the fate of the century, the political evolution. The, the, and these famines have been different. And actually, I would say that the real great conquest, from my point of view, is the original one. When I started to understand that the, the, the real, uh, how to say, weak point of all the discussion, the historiographical discussion about famine in the Soviet Union was that there was not a famine in the Soviet Union. There were many famines of different kinds, by the way, morphing over time and becoming other things. And that if you wanted to understand, you could not speak or argue about was there a famine, what kind of famine, but that there were many famines, and this applied also in general. Uh, you know, what can we say now? I tried, uh, I tried in this talk to, 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 to reflect upon this. And, and of course, dealing also with the relationship of these famines with genocide. First of all, of course, we all know that the, the use of starvation and hunger as a political tool is immemorial, you know, has been always used, and actually was even uh, considered legal up until World War II. You will remember being, as in Germany, the General von Leib was absolved in Nuremberg because of starvation in Leningrad, because to use starvation in war was legal, was not a crime. Uh, when President Lincoln asked Francis Liebert, that of course was a German scholar, but he had emigrated in the, in the US, and asked Liebert, who was his main legal advisor, can I use starvation against the South? Liebert answered, and I have to, I broke my glasses coming here, so I have these glasses look me, that I found that make me look like a, a, a high school teacher from the 1960s, but, um, so uh, the Liber answer in 1863 to Lincoln was that it was lawful to starve the hostile belligerent, armed or unarmed, so that it leads to the speeder subjection of the enemy. This was the legal doctrine up until 19, the 1960s, 70s, basically. One has always to remember this. Um, but even though this has been always with us, though, from this point of view, the, the possibility to use starvation as a tool, uh, of course, up until the late 19th century, I would say that most famines were, in quotation mark, natural. In the sense, there was, since then, there was always enough food and speedy ways of transportation to feed everybody everywhere. This started at the end of the 19th century. Before then, this was not so easy. Without the big ships, you know, the, the trains, the electric, whatever, the information and everything. So one could claim that after the end of the 19th century, all famines are political in one way or the other, which doesn't mean that they're all equal. They are very different, but you have to consider this. So. I already gave you the list of these famines, and, and this was proved, by the way, by Herbert Hoover, that during World War I was able to organize the, you know, the, 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 the food aid in belligerent countries during the war. So this proved that actually it was fully possible, and they did it on a large scale uh, uh, after World War I. Uh, the other thing that emerged from the list I gave you, because of course the other big political use of starvation are the Nazi hunger plan, but also especially the extermination of Soviet prisoner of wars in 43 million dead, you know, in forced starvation, uh, the ghetto starvation. Uh, clearly, and I mentioned the Armenian, the Chinese, the Cambodian, clearly you have a link, a clear link between great transformative projects. I am not now saying uh, all kind uh, tied to race ideology, class ideology, nationality ideology, 
religious maybe, I don't know, but you can imagine great, the great transformative projects of our century, independent of the, their tenets, are those that actually use their starvation the most, even in peacetime. This is a big difference I want to, because during wartime, you know, the British, as I told you, did it in wartime. The, the, one could claim that the Nigerian did it. But in peacetime, the, the Soviet Union in 1931 was a country at peace. Uh, China in 1958-59 was a country at peace. Uh, 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 Cambodia, Ethiopia. Uh, one could claim that actually, uh, it is that the, the Nazi Germany was at war, but it implemented it in such a way that one can uh, speculate. But still, that the, this great aggressive transformative project were the ones that used the, this tool the most. By the way, I don't know if you maybe some heard him, Graco Babeuf, uh, the first communist leader during the French Revolution, accused the Jacobin that after he was, as you know, executed by the Thermidorians, but before he was a critic on, on the left of the Jacobins, he accused the Jacobins of using starvation as a political tool against the Vandean peasant rebels. He wrote a book saying that the Jacobins are doing this to the Vandean uh, peasants to, to kill them by starvation. So th there is a long history of, let's say, of this aggressive elite guiding transformative projects very aggressive state-led transformative project that uh, uh, specialized in using this tool. Uh, um, of course, I'm not saying that all of this come from above. Uh, Christian Gerlacht, as you know, maintained, and I, I agree, there is also an element from below uh, in, in this mass categorical violence, let's call it this way. Uh, in my case, mass categorical violence, violence using uh, hunger as a tool. But I would say that the two things are not in contradiction and that one should, uh, that if one seriously tries to build a picture in the 20th century, the role of these projects has been the most important one, uh, especially, as I told you, in peacetime. Uh, by the way, the consciousness that this has been the case, you know, Stephen Devereux, which created at the beginning of the, this uh, millennia, uh, the, the millennium, the, the, the classification that is now in use to classify famine. There are great famine, more than 100,000 victims, catastrophic famines, mon more than one million victims. This is the classification now in use about famines. And he wrote that uh, starvation can be the direct result of peacetime political decision. Governments could aim to create famine, could regard famine as the tolerable or welcome outcome of other goals, or could have conflicting demands that relegate famine prevention to a lower priority. As you can see, you have a specter here of political famines already. There are many kinds. One that you want to use precisely against somebody. One that comes because you made a mistake and then you don't want to, let's say, uh, reverse your line because you want to attain other uh, aims. And one that you don't consider the feminine a problem, even if, if, if you, are, you are sorry for it, but uh, so what? And this is, I think, uh, let's say, a not very sophisticated classification, but already gives you an idea that when you think of political famines, you have to think in terms of classes, of types, even though they can morph, as I say, they can pass from one to the other. This is very important. And the best classification has been given to us by this legal American scholar, Marcus, in a famous article, and he distinguished four, not three kind. The fourth degree, I will not lose much time, and when, you know, the, the and the corrupt government doesn't care about the welfare of the citizens, so if the citizens starve, they don't do anything. Uh, the third is the authoritarian government that impervious to, to, to what happens to their citizens do elsewhere, so they don't take care of their citizens. And these are the, he said, these are not criminal, faminogenic state behavior. Then he says there are two criminal faminogenic behaviors, the second category one, the second category, which is when the famine is the direct consequences of policies that a government continues to follow despite knowing that they are causing mass starvation. 
This is precisely the case with the Soviet family. And then he says there is a first, and this is, he says, being a lawyer, mens rea is the uh, recklessness, is the mens rea of this famine. Then there is a first degree famine, and it, this is direct feminogenic behavior, when the state wants to provoke a famine in order to target somebody. And this happens, has happened, as they tried. Uh, what is really uh, interesting, I mentioned you so many cases, right? Big, you know, you, we now know that the famine, the Chinese famine of 58, 61, has been possibly the gravest, the most catastrophic famine in world history. Uh, there was one in Cambodia, one in Ethiopia, one in Biafra, the Armenian, I mentioned so many. Yet, as has been noted by an African specialist, those who study famine tend to have a blind spot regarding political and military criminality, and those who study genocide and mass atrocity tend to have the counterpart blind spot on famine and starvation, which is precisely the case, that this is like two communities that do not communicate, which instead is very clear they have to communicate because famine has been one of the main tools of, let's say, mass categorical killing as, or violence, as I pre prefer to call it. Uh, what is struck me, you know, this, some of these African scholars became friends, because, of course, we, we exchanged the idea. And what struck me is that when they referred to the use of political famine in Europe, in the West, let's say the West, I don't, I'm not a great believer in the West, but not the, the West, uh, not in the West as a category of historical interpretation. Uh, they said, but of course, the, the real example is the Nazi hunger plan, is the ghetto extermination and the uh, prisoner of war extermination, which is, by, by the way, a horrible. Plus, of course, Leningrad, though, as I told you, the marshal was, up, was acquitted because Leningrad was not considered a crime in, even at Nuremberg, at, uh, at, the, at the trial after the war. Uh, yes, I think we can maintain without any uh, doubt that the Soviet famines of the 20th century are by far the most interesting. If I may say so, interesting scientifically, horrible, if you want a moral judgment, let me speak to historian to historians, uh, by far the most important case. Because we have a family in two senses. First of all, we have the first, the first uh, acer uh, uh, certain uses of starvation as a tool are from the civil war to repress the Antonovshina, the famous peasants insurrection in the Tambov area. And there are fantastic documents published by Viktor Petrovich Danilo for read in the 90s in which you have all the orders to use famine as the Jacobins did against the Vandean peasants uh, 150 years previously. Uh, they used famine again during the 30s. Then you have still other uh, famines in the, let's say, in the war and after the war. And the last recorded famine is Moldova, which is different from the pan-Soviet Ukrainian famine of 46-47. It's very specific because Moldova was just Sovietized, so there was collectivization. So you have about from 1919, 1920 to 1947, it's about 30 years of use of hunger in different conditions against different targets with different degrees in different categories, as I told you, different types. So this is of extreme interest. We learned about it during this archival revolution I told you about, which has been really important. I will not mention the colleagues that were so important. For some I mentioned, Danilov, Kulchitsky, Klevniuk. I could mention Davis too, because he contributed, and Whitcroft contributed, Pianciola contributed, I did something too. Uh, 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 but, and now, as I told you, are demographers. This I insist, because this also, proves the great importance of multidisciplinarity. But, but why the demographers are important? For example, uh, you discover that in the Soviet famines, the Soviet famines are different from regular famine because in general, in regular famine, women have an advantage. They die less than the men because they are stronger, basically. 
In the Soviet famine, the, the women die more of the 30s, more than the men, for example. In regular famine, uh, people die of diseases more than directly of hunger. In the Soviet famines of the 30s, the only place in which diseases play a real role is the Kazakh, because the Kazakh were left to flee. And so they carried even bubonic plague to China. But the Kazakh, we will speak about the Kazakhs. It's a very interesting case, a totally different case. They were thus allowed some time to die. And so they ended up dying not only of starvation, but also of disease. In Ukraine, where they, when they decided to take the, the second, the crucial, the Holodomor famine, when they took everything at the end of 32, and in January 33, the Great Requisition, and demographers showed this with great precision, people started to die seriously en masse in March, April, May, and June. After two months, as it's directly from starvation, no time for disease to development. But this tells you that something special is happening. And also, for example, demographer, because we have spoken uh, requisition, very true, grain, very true. But if you look at mortality rates in Ukraine, and this the demographers told us, the highest mortality rates are in Kharkov and Kiev that are not grain producing regions. It's the south which is the grain producing region. So why you have supposedly a famine that is to take grain kills the most around the two capitals, where, by the way, in 1919, the revolts were stronger. So clearly, there is an element of politics. Indirectly, they, they are telling you there is an element of politics involved. I can continue to the many things that, um, and the other thing that is fantastic. When you remember that Kazakhstan was still part of the Russian Republic, so that the rates, the mortality rates for the Russian Republic include Kazakhstan, and you depurate Kazakhstan from the Russia, and you take the, the mortality rates, the, mor the Ukrainian mortality rates are so much higher for only for the spring of 1933. So much higher. The only comparable one are the Volga German Republic ones and the Kuban ones, but Kuban is like Ukraine in many ways. Uh, you know this more than I do. So this is clearly impressive that the demographers are telling you, look, you have to go and study why this is happening. So demographers have been extremely important. And as you see, the capacity to differentiate becomes the, the key to our understanding. I, 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 I will now if I have, yes, I have still time. So in 10 minutes, I will give you a picture only of, the, of this cluster of famines of the early 30s. When you remember the definition they were, gave us, you know, catastrophic great famine. If you put together the famine in the Soviet Union, you have seven famines in those three years. Two catastrophic, five great, which is quite extraordinary. The two catastrophic are, of course, the Kazakh one, 1.5 million. You know, the demo demographers are not so good with Kazakhstan because these were nomads, so that's very different. Many escaped to China, so the statistics are more complicated. While the Ukrainian famine now, I think, is the best uh, demographically studied famine in the 20th century, I think. Uh, Ukrainian famine, maybe 3.5, 4 million dead. So in between the two, 5 million out of the seven, that people that died in the Soviet Union of starvation in those years. So you have two huge catastrophic famine. The Kazakh one, in absolute term, smaller but larger in percentage on the population. Two very different famines. I would maintain, I don't know if I have the time, the, the, the time to elaborate, but I'm glad to take questions, that both of them are genocidal famines. One not intended because of its result and the impact of the Kazakh population, and the other also intended, but in, in, a, in a very special way. Then you have five great famines. The first one is the Kulak, uh, the Kulak one. You know, 200,000 Kulak died of starvation in during the transportation and arrived in non, arriving in non-existent uh, settlements. Les pièces pieds resiliency. 
one, more than 200,000 actually died of starvation. And this actually is a real first degree famine because they were targeted as Kulak as a specific category, hit because they were Kulak, although maybe they were not, deported and led to die alone. Uh, of course, they cannot be counted a, a, a genocide because, as you know, the convention that was mentioned excludes social groups. Uh, you cannot count, uh, to me, they are a genocide, but because it's the extermination of a group targeted as a group. But it's true that in the convention it does not mention the social, it's say, ethnic, religious, whatever. Uh, after this comes the Kazakh. I will only give you what really uh, Nicolò, my, my former student, is now a professor, as I told you, when he discovered this to me, because I always thought this was the, the, the result of the nomadization, of a modernizing project. Actually, he proved, and there is no doubt, that this was the result of the fact that since in 1931 there was no more meat for the rations of cities, Slavic cities, not only Russia although in, in Ukraine too, the majority maybe were Russians, but all the Slavic cities all over were, were left without meat rations. There was a Politburo order to take the Kazakh herd, uh, the Kazakh herd and to use the herd to feed the Slavic cities, the army and the bureaucracy. All the herds were taken from the Kazakh and the Kazakhs were left to die. Nobody intended to kill them. This to me, to, to this morning there was um, this discussion about colonial famines. I don't believe the, the, I don't believe, the, you can use colonial for the Ukraine. I don't believe it's so, the pa interpretive power is so strong. But for the Kazakh famine, how do you call a population that loses 1.5 out of, I don't know, 35% of the population in one year because they take away all the food they had? to bring it elsewhere, to feed another peoples. That this is really the, the most pure uh, colonial. And of course, nobody wanted to tar target the Kazakhs. They were not seen as a threat, as a menace. They, they just had the meat. So this uh, it's quite impressive. And this explains also why they were left to their own devices and why there was the time for plagues and diseases to develop that there was not in Ukraine. The third famine, uh, of course, after the Kazakh, is the pan-Soviet one, which has been the most contentious, because this has been the one that everybody used to deny that there was the Kazakh. Or the, because there was also a pan-Soviet famine, hard, hard times, times of troubles. So in the city, thanks to the Kazakh, meat arrived, also in 31, 32. Very little, but arrived. And, and of course, these two provoked more than 100,000 dead. And you know that this two was very, very, how do you say, dependent on rationing, that is on, on state choices and priorities. We now know, again, that, for example, in border areas, there was no deadly famine because the, 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 the Stalin and the Moscow government did not want to show Eastern Europe that, that, that there was famine within to show that things were going badly in the country. So the, the border areas were fed, more even than Moscow. Uh, you have that in Moscow things were much better than in Leningrad, and Leningrad was much better than Kharkiv, and Kharkiv was better than uh, Baku. But you have that, for example, we now know that in Transcaucasia, and especially in Georgia, and Armenia, basically, there was almost no famine. And when the peasant fleeing Ukraine and Northern Caucasus went there, the local leadership were very happy to put them back on ships and deport them back to Ukraine or the Northern Caucasus. They didn't want these peasants that were dying of hunger. So there too, you have a famine that it's true, it's pan-Soviet, it depends on the wrong choices, of the failure of collectivization, of the, because it was a failure. Here I don't think what today, I heard that Stalin in 32 felt secure. I think Stalin in 32 did this, which we are going to talk about because he felt totally insecure. The wife committed suicide. People were thinking that he had done a disaster in the country and he wanted, he was desperate to reacquire power, I think. But so you have this, I cannot 
elaborate, but again, I am very happy to. Uh, and by the way, what happened with the pan-Soviet famine shows that they know perfectly what to do to remedy the famine. In, uh, there was the moderate turn in the spring of 32 when they imported secretly grain from Iran and, and other places, uh, and they uh, did a little neonep was even called by somebody. Of course, it was very little. But they knew what to do if they wanted to avoid the famine. The problem is that, as Bogdan Klid told us, but it was not only Ukraine, in the summer of 32, it was a total disaster. If you read the correspondence between the Bolshevik leaders, they felt they were on the verge of the abyss. Because the policy launched the, the, the leaky perelon was a disaster because Stalin had made a disaster. And this was told openly, even when Orjonikidze wrote to uh, Kaganovich. So what to do? And they decided based, I will not elaborate, this was explained very well by Bogdan, based also on this national interpretation that was given partly rightly, partly because it was, uh, I think Stalin had its own paranoia, as we know. But it was decided to reverse course in some places with different degrees of intensity, basically in grain producing regions, basically, but as I told you about Kiev and Kharkiv, not only in grain producing regions. And, and the, the main regions that were hit were the Northern Caucasus, the Kuban, the the Tambovshina, the, the place where the Tambovshina had been, the, the black, the central black, black earth region, especially, I have to say, the Ukrainian uh, provinces at the border with Russia, with the Ukraine, that were, we have all the statistics, were it more. And there, the same policy was applied, yellow Russia too, in a way, because Stalin was afraid a little bit. But, so again, was not only grain, but the diversity of intensities that in Ukraine, as was proven, and I think it's enough this, I understand we can go on, but if you take the crucial decree of December, I think, 1432, on grain requisition in Ukraine, a decree that is on grain requisition in Ukraine, half of it is about the reversal of Ukrainization. So I, I'm, it's Stalin that is putting the things together openly, that is not, they don't have to study a lot to see this. In a decree about grain requisition, there is a reversal of the 1923 uh, Ukrainization policies. And then come the terrible requisition I told you about, and then comes the horrible and deadlier policy, you know. So you have this huge catastrophic famine. You have a famine, a major famine, a great famine in Northern Caucasus. You have one in the central Black Earth region. And you have this, I, I mean, here in Germany, I understand it, but really a study of the Volga German Republic is something that should be done. Let me tell you that it's, it's really insane that we don't have a good book on this. And, uh, uh, but I want to make a case just because to understand that the thing was different case, everybody was more or less touched by this. The Jewish tetl not the Jewish population of the great cities, that of course being in a great city was an advantage then because of rationing, but the shtet that had lived off the relationship with the Soviet, with the Ukrainian village, even a conflictual, difficult relationship, but they were living off the Ukrainian agriculture, being traders, artisans, that had been hit already by the anti net policies of the late 20s, that you know, the rabbis were persecuted, the artisans were closed, the, 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 the uh, traders were repressed, so they had been already weakened. By 1932, they could not count on the Ukrainian village anymore, and the rationing was cut, because these were small centers, with the reform of rationing of 32, because there was not enough to eat, but for big cities and border areas, and the army, Shtetl suffered enormously for this. In fact, they could count on American and Canadian, you know, aid. You know, there was a lot. The Soviet actually uh, encouraged foreign aid to have valuta. Um, so you have 
a, you know, a cluster of famines. And if you take Marcus, I will not elaborate because I have only 10 minutes left, I will say. But uh, you can see how many of them there are of different kinds. You remember the four categories. Actually, of the first three, the fourth there was not. And some of them switched from the, first to the, from the second to the first, as the Ukrainian did. The Ukrainian was clearly a second case uh, famigenic famine, let's say, and became a first degree after the December 1932, and then reverted uh, to a more normal situation in, uh, in the summer of 33, when the job was done. And the job was in this place being I am speaking to an Ukrainian German commission. The job was to hit the Ukrainian both as peasants and as Ukrainian. Because Kosior, you know, there is this famous letter of Kosior to Stalin that hunger has not taught the peasants a lesson yet. I think this is March 33. So you have to starve them more. Which is quite amazing, no? This is a Pavlovian. Uh, peasants are, let's say, like nomads. That is, they are out of civilization. They're temnata, right? We can do whatever. We have to teach them how to live, how to obey. And we use starvation as with dogs to do this. And this says, we, this didn't work yet. So we have to do more of this, March 33. Famine, the mortality is speaking all over which is quite impressive. Stalin is receiving letters from his friends among, the, for example, the Kazakh leadership of the disaster that is happening in Kazakhstan. So he knows everything. He is receiving uh, OGPU reports. Actually, he's winning. He's happy to receive these reports. Because the choice that he made in late 32 to save the regime from his own failure is paying, is winning. You know that the Congress in February 34 is called the Congress of the Winners because they won against the peasants and the nationalities and Ukraine. It is a war. Stalin told this is famous to Churchill many years later. He said we had a war with the Kulak. He didn't mention Ukraine then. So what does, uh, once you have this in your mind, what do this famine let us see? They let us see a lot. I will finish in 10 minutes. So, uh, Just to give you an example, it's so rich what we can see. Because I think by now, I, I don't know, I might be my age, that I like especially the things that make me see more things than before. Or make me see things differently from before. I think that the capacity to see is the best thing we can have. And, for example, when you explain the popular support of the cold, for the Cold War anti-Soviet in the West, if you don't take in account the diasporas, in, in this, and, 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 and this diaspora have the famine behind them, even the Jewish one, if you don't get the support that the Ukrainian, the Jewish, and, and the other gave, but even the Russian, eh? because, by the way, one thing that, uh, again, we can say that Stalin was nationalizing the interpretation of the family, but always from a Marxist point of view. These were Marxists. Stalin was never a nationalist. He always, up to the, the, the last book he wrote, was the economic problems of socialism. He believed in this. And, and it was never, up until the 30s, it was, he started to use Russian nationalism at the beginning of the 30s to to deal with the disaster he had made. But for example, speaking of genocide, you know that the, by far the most uh, totally destroyed category in the Great Terror is Russian Orthodox priests. 85%. This fully comply with the definition of the uh, genocide in the convention, in the UN convention. Because if you have a religious group and you kill 85% of the priests, that is, you know, numbers are not a problem, but uh, as we discovered, no, that, that, that is, you are destroying all the priests, you are destroying the Orthodox Church. Then you will remade it in 43, as you know. But he destroyed it in the 30s. So remember, it's always a problem uh, of, of transformative projects. And Stalinist transformative project was not a nationalist project. 
this I'm very convinced, and I think uh, it's very difficult to. So I told you, it shows us the Cold War in a new light, for example. It shows us, and I will not elaborate because Bogdan did a great job, I've written about this, the relation between the social and the national, also in Stalin's mind. It is a crucial point. They made this many times, so I will not repeat myself. And I think Anne Applebaum did a great job because she showed us the relation of these two elements over 15 years. And how important it is to see 1919 when you analyze 1932 which is crucial, I think. It shows us the role of these aggressive elites in the 20th century. That is something you want to see, because it's true that there is violence from below, but there is a lot of violence from above, from these aggressive elites produced by the war, by First World War I. Uh, I'm not saying that they, that they were, uh, they come from something, but, it's also a project that many of these transformative projects, in spite of having many different creeds, this I told you, for example, the Nazi project was basically a racist project, one could say, between nationalists and racists, but more racist than nationalists, maybe. The Soviet one was socialist, the other one was... All of them had a, something that was common, was this idea that the population was, could be organized by categories, and in order to transform the population in the sense you wanted to transform the population, you had to hit the categories, family from mind. That is, you do away with kulak, you do away with whatever, you kill this, you transform this. So it was a categorical way of thinking. That's why I like the idea of mass categorical violence that is, uh, for the first time, I think, explained very well by Scott Strauss, who is a, an African is who studied the Baya, Biafra, uh, not the Biafra, sorry, the, the, Tuts, uh, the Rwanda and Burundi mass killings, uh, I think. Uh, so, and I have to say that uh, I'm now studying this a lot, but what moved me to study this is that, for example, if you read, uh, this is a lecture, maybe a reading, maybe a, you all did it already, but go and do it again, because it's really, each time you read it, it's fantastic. You read the secret Prikazi of 1937-38 that are organized by categories that are to be hit in order to transform society. This is precisely the most pure, the purest form of this idea that in order to transform society, you have to read it into categories and you have to hit groups independently by human behavior and individual behavior. And this is, I think, a, a very, this is something that this famine too show you, the use of starvation against groups. Another thing that they let you see is another family of famines, because I told you there have been Nazi famines, young Turk famines, uh, even British-sponsored famines, political famines. But clearly the most important family of these political famines in the 20th century is the socialist one. Because from the Soviet up to the Korea, North Korea is not a family, it's something very different if you study it closely. But up to the Derg, the Ethiopian famine of the early 80s, these are all political famines that are the product of a socialist attempt to transform society based on the idea that peasants are bad. That peasants are an obstacle on the way of modernization. So that these are anti-peasants, even when they use a pro-peasant rhetoric. Mao thought that he was different from Stalin, but if you read Stalin in 1929, when Gorky, that was very intelligent, wrote his, how uh, to say, his ideology, even Stalin spoke, you know, the, the the Kolkosian singing and being happy. Stephen Stalin was ideologically pro Kolkosian and pro peasant. The, the statue of the, the famous statue of the worker and the Kolkosnitsa is there to remind us. It's not that Stalinism was ideologically. When you read the private correspondence of pro peasants are brutes, but this is different. Uh, so it lets you see this, which is a great frontier of research. And of course, and with this I finish the last three minutes, it lets you see the relationship between famines and genocide. As I told you, I became convinced, uh, let me tell you, for I, genocide for us historians is a very complicated category 
Because, of course, there is a legal category with legal consequences that has been established under political conflict. If you read Anton Weiss, Weiss Van books, they are very beautiful, he explained this. But it's, of course, a political, a, a legal category. And if you're accused of genocide and, and sentenced according to that convention, there are even financial consequences, legal consequences. You can go to jail. You have to pay indemnity. You have to pay even if you are no more responsible, let's say. But this, it's interesting. It's politically extremely important. But to us historians, I don't think it can be sufficient. Because, of course, the extermination of groups in the 20th century, I'm a special of the 20th century, maybe even before, it is something much bigger than this. Take the Kulak. So the Kulak are what? Take the Ukrainian famine. Stalin didn't want to kill them all. So it enters even in the US Convention, because the UN, the, the UN Convention says the, the, the whole group or part of it. So the, 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 the Ukrainian are in. The Kazakh, there is no intent, whatever. If not, that they wanted to get the meat. Can you deny that when you lose, if somebody will come to Italy and take all our pasta, and about 20 million Italian dies in one year, you think that we will not say that this is a genocide? Or if somebody comes to Germany and takes all the kartoffel and whatever, and you are 90 million, 30 million Germans die in one year of starvation. Can you deny this being genocide? Can, is it really something you want to argue? It, 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 to me, it's a joke, right? It's uh, unarguable. So really, this opens up a field, so I cannot, I, I have to finish in 30 seconds, which is the field of what does it mean, genocide as a historical interpretation tool, which is a field that we have to build. We cannot rely on lawyers or on judges. This is not so interesting. It's politically very relevant, but it's not so interesting. But if you ask me, and with this I finish, what is the, of course, there is the, the last problem is legacies. This is the last, really. If you think of the, of these famines, the legacies have been huge. Think of the legacies in Ukraine. The famines have been a major tool of nation building after 1991. In Kazakhstan, it's even more interesting. It's, they all know, but they don't use it. But they all knew. So there is a legacy, and this is evolving, and now they are using it. So even there, it's very interesting what can happen in Kazakhstan. But if you ask me what is the greatest legacy of this mass political famine of the 20th century, it stands hoping for modernization, which is precisely the answer to the great famine of 5861, that in 62, he and Liu Shaoqi were called by Mao to solve. They were able to solve, and Mao then decided to get rid of them. So I think that the, all, the greatest political, economic, social innovation, change of the late 20th century has been an answer to the most important political famine of the 20th century. And with this, I stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Andrea Graziosi. And now the floor is open for questions and answers and later for discussion. I see that Gennady, you're ready for your question. Already with a mic in his hand. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, him. yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrea, for the uh, illuminating thoughts on the issue. Um, in the spirit of international cooperation, I'll spare you my genocide remarks. However, I have an observation, a comment, and a question. So uh, as far as uh, observation, well, you're welcome to walking into my uh, colonization trap by essentially demonstrating that uh, you're looking into the um, cultural proximity and percentage of <clears throat> particular groups, population perishing from particular policy to decide whether or not a relationship between the group was colonial or not. Case in point, Kazakh, the Kazakhs versus the Ukrainians. Um, my comment, uh, you mentioned uh, several times uh, 
great famines as catastrophic famines and other famines which are also important but do not amount to this uh, um, the designation of catastrophes. I think there might be a wrong premise to, st to stand on because I am not, I don't really see how from the Soviet leadership perspective those famines amount to cat catastrophes. I don't see there is anything wrong with those famines and all those uh, losses because they precisely achieved the objective that the Soviets had by, uh, you know, essentially breaking the backbone of uh, independent uh, nationhood project, let's say in the case of the Ukrainians. So I don't see what's the problem there as far as they were concerned. Everything worked fine. There's no catastrophe at all. Uh, and human loss is just a, it's a totally separate issue. Well, my actual question has to do with the uh, sense of famine as supposedly relatively modern phenomenon that is to you, uh, that famine is used as a political weapon against various populations. Um, because I, as far as I understand famine, uh, like never before famine actually took place. Actually? Never took place before because what the situation when there was a lack of food due to natural uh, processes. That essentially was known as hunger. So people who were starving were able to move somewhere where there was a supply of food or had the food delivered to them. And only with uh, obstacles that were imposed by political will through wars or borders or some other policies that are man-made, famine became a phenomenon per se. So in that sense, famine was always a political tool. It was invented precisely as a policy of deliberate starvation and annihilation of population. So I wonder if you um, can uh, maybe uh, offer more thoughts of, of famine as a sort of artificial versus uh, natural famines, if there is such a thing that you make a distinction about. Thank you. Should I answer one by one? Or? No, I think there is, um, I was not clear evidently. When I say great and catastrophic, it's not a judgment. I said it was a success, actually, I said that it was a Congress. There is a field called famine studies. My, maybe the subtext was we have to go out of the Soviet field. There is a huge field called famine studies. In famine studies, which is a literature on the many famines. There are specialists, and they distinguish famines by name in two classes. Great, more than 100,000. So it's a classification term. It's not a judgment if they were a success or a failure. Is that a famine is called great if it makes more than 100,000. It's called catastrophic if it makes more than 1 million victims. And actually, this categorization in the use because this famine studies is very much tied to food aid. So if there is the threat of a great famine, they start to do something. If there, is the, there was the threat of a catastrophic fam famine, hunger, they are going to do something else. So these are also operational tools, but I think they are very useful for us. That is, we cannot live within only Soviet studies. As to, I will not touch the colonial. It is my impression that I said I consider the Kazakh famine a colonial famine in a way. I have a problem in classifying the Ukrainian famine as a colonial famine because I think the relation between Ukraine and Russia were not simply colonial. I don't think you go very far. There is an element. I'm not denying that there is an element. But I, I don't think you can reduce the relationship between Ukraine and Russia uh, as a colonial relations. This is my personal impression. Maybe I'm wrong, but this is the, the, my. The, 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 the last part, I don't agree. In the sense that I, we have to use the term scholars use. There are early modern scholars that use the word famine to describe natural, by natural causes. That is, there is no food and there is a famine. There are studies, the, the famine uh, in France, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the famine in Sweden, in, uh, 
that the term is currently used by scholars in all fields to denote also the lack of food due, for example, to drought, to, to diseases uh, of the plants, of the grain. So there are, f what the, the point you, you have, which is true, is that I tried to say it very, fa very rapidly at the beginning, it's true that after the last decades of the 19th century, in a way, all the famines became political because they were the instrument to feed everybody. So from this point of view, it's true that all the famines after, let's say, the 1880s have a political component. What I also try to, to say is that there are different kind of political famines. If you, even if you accept that all of them are political, which I, in a very abstract sense, I would agree with you in the sense that if there are the means, the ships, the, the airplanes, the, 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 the food reserve to feed everybody, and you don't do it, of course there is a, an element of politics involved, of context, of diplomatic, whatever. But of course at that point, you cannot say that they're all equal, so you have to distinguish. And I think Marcus de Vereux, which is one of the most important uh, uh, scholars of feminine studies, distinguished three kinds. I think Marcus' distinctions are more useful. And actually, by studying the Soviet families, there are so many, I think that you actually find that the Marcus' distinction is very operational. So if maybe some, someday someone will come with a better solution, but I think now it's a very operational tools that they would recommend you to use. Uh, thank you so much for your great and thoughtful talk. Um, well, if, if I have a remark or a question, and maybe just an echo to your to your talk, uh, if I understood you correctly, you said that um, at the end of your talk um, that it does not matter so much uh, to define uh, in concrete terms the, the concept of genocide and that if there are millions of deaths who uh, victims of starvation, then it is a genocide. I, I like this statement um, because it is indeed very artificial to discuss the various elements of this concept of, of uh, genocide, but anyway, uh, we are, of course, uh, our discussion is, of course, defined by this uh, UN Convention about Genocide, and uh, this convention is about uh, ethnic, national, religious victims, and therefore we were also in our, at our conference always discussing the question, was it uh, was the genocide uh, nationally framed? And if I again, if I understood you correctly, um, there was a certain contradiction between the discussion we had with Bogdan Klit and and your paper, and this we we can really be proud of that we have contradictions and different. Uh, statements, um, but I, I would like to ask, uh, well, two questions. The first is, as we discussed with Bogdan Klit, isn't it uh, remarkable and uh, maybe even decisive for our dis discussion that um, Stalin was fearing that uh, Ukraine might uh, that there might be a national uprising uh, in Ukraine and that Ukraine might leave the uh, Soviet Union. I think this was uh, one statement from your uh, last lecture one year ago, that, that this was one of your arguments too. And, and the second point is that this um, end of the Koronizatia meant 
that uh, this idea of unity and diversity was given up. And if there is no idea of unity in diversity or no idea of diversity, then there must be some uh, cultural idea of unity. And this cultural idea of unity is, of course, in the Soviet Union, first of all, a social idea. But I think the social cannot uh, cover all. And, and I think one could argue that undercover a, Rus a Russian idea of unity must have emerged after the, the, after the, den after the end of Karanizatia. Yes. Thank you so much. These are difficult questions. First of all, very interesting. Let me go back. When I, I'm, I'm happy that you agree with me because it's very difficult to pass moral historical judgment. You have the, the Kazakh example is the best. You have 1.5 million, almost all of them Kazakh, that die in the most horrible ways because people are taking away the meat from them, the herd, to feed somebody else. Nobody wants them dead. They are not afraid. There is no foreign menace. Stalin openly says so. There is, no, there is no reversal of Korinizatia for the Kazakh. So you have, but still, you have a policy that destroys the culture of a people. I'm not, I don't want to be Herderian, though I recognize that Herder is a great man, but still, the culture of people exists. And they, this nomadic culture of the Kazakh is uprooted completely, almost. And the Kazakh actually have difficulties. In the they all become Russian-speaking. They all go to cities. How do you call something like this? Regardless now of the legal uh, definition. Because I agree, if you use the UN legal definition, it's very difficult to say that this is genocide. Because intent. Nobody wanted to kill in a way. But to me, this. It's not because the jurist in 1947, you know, that the British sent the, the text to the uh, imperial governors to see if there was something they could be accused of. The French canceled part, that the Stalin and Molotov read all the part. So I don't think that the document that was composed this way is my law as an historian, is my interpretive tool as a historian. Once this has been said, so that I telling you that personally as a historian, I want to build my own interpretive tools. I want to be free to build my own interpretive tools. When you say this, come into Ukraine, because you are very right in raising the point. Ukraine seems to be a case even within the boundary of the UN Convention. Because there is intent, because of the reason you say, because there is this national theory of the famine that Stalin himself elaborates, because there is the, the use of this against peasants, as peasants and as Ukrainians, because Stalin complements this with the very conscious policies of destruct, the destruction of intellectuals, language. Remember, the dictionaries are withdrawn, and all the words with roots that were not Russians are substituted. So you have the policies are clearly intellectually devised. So it's not that they are doing this because they want to take something they needed from the Ukrainian peasants. Also because otherwise, why more in Kharkiv and Kiev and not in, in the, in the grain-producing area of the South? So I think that the Ukrainian uh, Holodomor fits even the UN Convention. Once this has been said, since I'm not a lawyer, although I sympathize completely with the, the fact that the Ukrainian wants this to be recognized, uh, to me as a historian, this is, this is not my primary concern. I, if I am asked, I said yes, this is a, a, a genocide even uh, within the, the frame of the UN Convention. The, the real point is that as somebody says, and I don't disagree with Bogdan actually, no, well, there is only one thing I don't think, maybe I did not understand, uh, because generally I agree with him, and I read his papers before coming. He was kind enough to send it to me. Uh, the problem is that Stalin 
I'm very sorry to say this, was very intelligent. Very, 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 very intelligent. Was not stupid at all. And Stalin studied how to build and how to unbuild. Also because when you decide that you can build a nation, you can use the same block to unbuild the nation and to distort and to recast it. And I think that he applied to Ukraine precisely this, a recasting through a lesson using starvation and repression and a different Ukrainization. And so the, here the, what he aimed at, and I think Ukraine is still paying because Ukraine went through a terrible tragedy because of this, is this relatively successful, unfortunately, Stalin's very intelligent attempt to recast the Ukrainian nation in a way that was more manageable for him. Not from Russia. In 33, Stalin was, was killing Russian popes, was killing all the Russian intellectuals. I don't think it was for Russian nation. You ask a good question today. What about the perpetrators? This was a transformative project. I, I think we should pay, we should respect the ideology of people that do things, even we don't like them. But if I do something because I believe I'm going to build socialism or to build a, a perfect a space for a Nordic race of dolicocephal, I don't know how they were called, that are blonde and tall and beautiful. If I'm doing this for this, I have to recognize that I'm doing this for this. I cannot deny the intent. Stalin was building socialism, was not modernizing Russia. This was called socialist construction. This was the idea, and, and there were many Ukrainian, Ukrainians and Jews and uh, Belarusian and even some Kazakhs that believed in this and were ready to apply these policies. And, and we have to admit this. This is totally normal. I, I think we don't, the, the mistake is to nationalize too much from our today's point of view. This I think is a mistake. Because these people were not, uh, Stalin was something that knew how to use, he had been a nationalist, this was said this morning, he had been a very strong nationalist in his youth, a Mazzini kind of nationalist. If you read these poems, that maybe Slavko did, they're very horrible, but very typical. Uh, and, and he knew that these nationalists were beasts that had been controlled, changed, that he, the, 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 but that you could use against them the very element you had given them to build the nation. This is it, what he did, I think. This is my impression. In the name of something different. Uh, so the, the clear point is that it's not just against the nation. It's this idea that he was trying to build something different. If you don't have to lose this, I think. If you lose this, you lose the 20th century. This is my impression. Because too many attempts were made to, to build something different. Which, you know, some of them were very, you know, there were reasons that people wanted to change things. Huh? It's not that they were crazy. Thank you so much. I believe I have a, a room for more another two questions and I also welcoming the participants who are online to also put their questions. Я також прошу тих учасників наших, хто є онлайн, ви теж можете ставити питання. Прошу вас. Богдан, yeah. Богдан Кліт. Go ahead, Богдан. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. Okay, do I have it now? Yeah, that's fine. Am I okay now? Lower, Go ahead. Okay, um, a short comment and a, a question based on the comment. Um, in the case of the Kazakh famine, um, you mentioned meat was being uh, sent to the cities to feed um, the Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians. Um, but uh, um, it should also be, I think, pointed out that some of that meat was also exported abroad and that um, during the famines, um, not only grain was being exported, but meat, 
fowl, um, eggs, uh, fish, um, flour, um, butter. So um, the um, Soviet government was, um, uh, could you comment on this perhaps and how, and does this reinforce your view that the Kazakh famine was a colonial famine? No, this is, you are perfectly right. Also, there was a formal, as you know, a form of, I would say, inner export in the sense that they were selling in special store these products for gold and valuta also to Soviet citizens, Torxin. You know, there is a beautiful mm. book by Elena Sokina. Uh, Elena wrote a really important book on this in the 90s already. Uh, but this is, again, this gives me the opportunity. The, the problem is that Stalin, with the Veliki Perelom, did the disaster. By 1930, he was admitting the disaster. If you read the proceedings of the 16th Cent uh, Congress in July 1930, they, they were saying we were a major disaster. They were saved by the Germans, by the way. They were saved by the German credits because they had no more money. All the factories were stopped in, the 1930, in 1930. If you read it, it's really dramatic. Then the Germans give them money, gave them money because of course it was in the interest of Germany because German industry was desperate to sell equipment. So the idea of giving government, how to say, uh, guaranteed loan to Soviet to buy German goods and machine and machinery was a very, very good for German industry. And in 1932, I think this is a, thank you very much, because this is an important, 1931, sorry, they relaunched the failed Veliki Verelom. It's like they, they started one in 1928, as I think Slavko was saying, it went to a major crisis already in the summer of 1930. They acknowledged the crisis. In 1931, at the beginning of 1931, they get the German loans. They relaunch a major industrialization drive, and they need to repay the loans. And you know that when Hitler arrives in power, they were not able to repay the loans, and all the German industrialists went to Hitler begging him to extend the guarantees, and which Hitler did, by the way. So they were in a situation at the end of 1930, beginning of 31, especially after the German loans, that they had to repay the, 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 the installments, that they needed to export everything or to sell for valuta and gold in the Torxin store, like a mine. The population was like a mine to be mined, let's say. The Kazakh for meat, and we for our gold necklaces or the... And, and actually for two, three years they continued to export. Uh, meat was exported a lot, but meat was difficult to be exported. Uh, you know the famous story that when they tried to help, I think Jaruzelski, and they tried to send meat to Poland according to what I was told, that they arrived in train that were used to carry coal without refrigeration, so you didn't want that meat. Meat needed refrigeration, needed a lot of meat needs. But it's completely true that they use the meat also for export. But grain, sugar, timber, fur, whatever, gold, whatever, you know, with forced labor. Export became their most important activity from the point of view of the success of industrialization. The problem is that by 1932, by the summer of 32, in spite of all the requisitions, the, the, the torques in, the, the forced slave, they were not able to repay the loans. So by 1932, they were again in a major crisis. So we are used to think of a Western crisis in 29. The Soviet Union went to, through two different crises. 30 and 32, 33, and actually, and here Gennady was very right, the use of famine and starvation to, 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 you know, to, to break the peasants, to break the Ukrainians, to made possible the great victory of 1933. In 1934, Stalin claimed he was a victor. 
if you ask me, I wrote this, so I will repeat it. To me, this was people by now nearby him, even his friend, were afraid of him. Because somebody that in order to win had starved to death seven, eight million people and boasted about it was not precisely, you know, your best friend. And this explains why major Soviet leaders that were not weak men because they had done horrible things already in the Civil War, by 1935 were ready to do everything in order to please Stalin. And you may remember that Khrushchev and the other even danced between them when he said. So actually, I would claim that this victory by Stalin in 1934 changed forever the relationship between Stalin and this circle of friends. Let's, go in. Let's call it this way. Yeah, the, just to finish, because this to me was very, the only way, the only time in which Stalin was really afraid was at the beginning of World War II when Germany invaded, you know, and this went to his dacha, and they went, and it looked like, I, we, we believe, that, that he believed that they had gone to arrest him because of the disaster. But apparently, they had gone there to ask for his leadership, so this is immaterial if it's true or not. The, they too had been, had, been, had been broken in 1933, 34. I think that the, everybody was broken in 33, 34. Piatakov, of, that was you know, the chief Trotskyite and one of the great industrializers, in a private letter we found during the Archive Revolution in 36, offered to kill his wife personally to prove his fealty. It's not even in the Middle Ages. That is, you have a, he was a person with a degree from Kiev. The, uh, the son, he played piano. The, and he write a letter, if you want, I can kill my wife with my own hand so that I... This is the kind of world we're talking, right? So we shouldn't... And, and this too, that you have a person that, as Bogdan was saying, people are starving by millions, the Kazakh, by bubonic plague, and you have the report that they are dying by... And you are exporting the meat or the... the, the, the this is quite, you know, striking. <laughs>